Hello everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. If you are joining us for the first time, I'm Ashley Koff. I'm a registered dietitian and CEO of the Better Nutrition Program. And these are our Better Nutrition Expert interviews. Um, so much fun for me, very self-serving also, because I have topics and people that I want to talk to and ask questions of. And so this is that time, but it's also here for you. Um, so if you have any questions, if you're joining us live today, or you just want to let us know where you're joining us from, um, please uh, let us know. And if you're joining us um, at a time that is better for you, i.e. not live with us, we can still answer your questions. I will make sure that our expert gets them and we'll get her expertise. Um, so feel free to go ahead and ask your uh, questions on that part. Um, so uh, we will get started. Um, and uh, just a reminder as well that um, we are uh, here today. My expert also has a medical license among many other uh, backgrounds, which we'll get into. Um, but we are not prescribing any or making any medical recommendations. This is information that we are sharing. If you have any questions, you should follow up with a licensed medical practitioner that works specifically with you. So uh, without further ado, we were just wrapping some Duke conversation because my guest today is also a Dukey, um, so that's always awesome. And uh, Karen Ansel joins us, one of my favorite dietitians um, who has lived many lives from fashion buying to finance um, to uh, joining the world of nutrition. We, I was just finding out that instead of her two-year plan as a diet to become a dietitian, it was an eight-year plan with, with uh, children involved in there. Um, so we loved, loved hearing that part. And um, one of the reasons Karen is particularly the exact right person that I wanted to have this protein conversation with is because she's a journalist. So she has her nutrition degree um, and she also writes story. And as a journalist, I think she's also going to be really helpful to help us um, understand the difference in a lot of the communication around protein that were, um, you know, sort of shared at us, uh, ranging from advertising to influencer communication to friends sharing information to what a journalist may actually uh, come up with. So, Karen, welcome. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And I thought by way of introduction, I might be putting you on the spot, so if an answer doesn't come up quickly, it's okay. But I was going to ask it, you, um, what is your favorite protein? My favorite protein, wow. Um, so actually, my favorite protein is dairy, and I like it because it multitasks. Mm -hmm. You know, all of us need more calcium, so it's a great way to get calcium, and it's got a really available source of protein. So when they look at, you know, when they do studies of protein quality, dairy actually has one of the highest quality proteins. So your body uses it really well. I also like it just because it's an easy way to add on. So I'm not a vegetarian, but I eat a mostly plant-based diet. And a lot of times that means that I'm not getting protein with, you know, if I'm having a grain bowl, I'm not getting a lot of protein, but I could have a container of yogurt and boom, there you go. I'm getting, you know, maybe 12 or 15 grams of really great quality protein along with it. And then in addition, I really love the way it tastes. Mm. So it's just a win all around for me. So if I had to name my favorite, that would be the one. You're the um, dairy girl. I love it. So yeah, you yeah. raised, um, so starting right out there, like I can think of like 10 different things, like in this info beast society, like of things that I'm like, wait a minute, like I've been told like I shouldn't have dairy or um, I've also been told that of course, if I'm eating grains or I'm having broccoli or I'm having sesame seeds, that those are good sources is a protein. So let's start off with um, the world of what is a protein and what, why is it, so as a follow-up to what is a protein, um, uh, I want to start to dive into what are some of the, the conflicting information about how we can take in protein. But we'll start with what is a protein. Right. So a protein is basically there are three, um, I feel so silly saying this too because you're a dietitian, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> there are three major, they're called macronutrients and they're nutrients that our bodies need in large supply. So there's protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And they all have slightly different functions. But protein, well, they have actually very different functions. Mm -hmm. But protein is the building block function. So it's what builds your muscles, it builds enzymes, it actually helps build antibodies that keep you from fighting infections, it helps build hormones. So anything that needs to be constructed in your body comes from protein. And protein is made also of building blocks called amino acids, and there are a bunch of them. Um, and some foods have all of them, and some foods only have some of them. So when you look at protein, it's important just to make sure that you're getting all the amino acids that you need. And usually if you eat a pretty balanced diet, you can. 
Um, but it's important that if for some reason, if your diet is restricted in some way, that you are paying attention and making sure you're getting all those amino acids. Yeah. So um, I love, so first of all, I'm the biggest fan of broccoli, like probably my hair, if I had to choose a food that I was like, oh, I'm like, I like, I love broccoli, right? And I'm like the curly hair girl, the curly haired broccoli. Um, But you know, it kind of blows my mind sometimes when I see broccoli on these lists or like an Instagram where it's like, and here's, you know, here's what I'm eating for, for protein. Now to your point, the amino acid piece. So where are people going wrong when they're hailing the or talking about the protein value of some of these foods? Well, I think one of the biggest things I see, um, and I notice this a lot because since I write, I read a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest mistake that I see a lot of times, sometimes people will say X food has Y nutrient, right? Mm -hmm. And foods have lots of nutrients. So broccoli may contain some protein. It probably does. Vegetables do have small amounts. But just because it contains protein doesn't make it a good source of protein. So it has a teeny bit of protein. So I I think that's where it comes to, you know, when you're getting your nutrition or even your health information, who are you getting it from? Where are you getting it from? Um, Is it somebody who actually has a degree in nutrition who can say, you know, who knows? Yeah, broccoli has some protein, but A, it's not a lot. And B, the kind that it has is not going to be very helpful to you. Um, so it's really, it's it's minuscule. So um, somebody who can put that in perspective, as opposed to somebody else who might see a list of nutrients in a food and be like, oh, there's protein here, assuming that just because there's protein, it's a good source of protein. I love that. When we were working, and of course, at the Better Nutrition Program, we have nutrition assessment tools um, that are developed by practitioners specifically so that if you're coming into your doctor or your dietitian and saying like, do I need more protein, we can go through and actually assess and see, you know, what foods are you eating and that that sort of a thing. But backing up from that, I think one of the things that has been challenging to people is actually the conversation about Um, So is it the quantity of protein I need? Is it the quality? Is it the frequency? And I'll say like, all right, well, it's kind of all of those things. So take us through, (laughs) like, so take us through, you know, you were talking about a plant-based diet. How do we meet our protein needs and how do we, and then we can get into how we know what we need. Right. I mean, you can meet your protein needs on a plant-based diet, but you can't just wing it. So for example, when people say that they're going vegetarian or vegan, I mean, those can be unbelievably healthy diets, but you can't just dive in without a plan, especially if you're going vegan where there are many nutrients that may be missing and protein is one of them. So you really do need to plan it out and say, if I'm going to eat this way, or even if you're just eating a mainly plant-based diet and are not full on vegetarian, if this is going to be a nutrient that may be in short supply where am I going to get it Mm -hmm. and realize that you're going to need more of it and that you're going to need to have it more frequently and find ways to incorporate it in your diet that you like. That's the other thing too. It's like if you're going to be a vegan or you're thinking about being vegan and I'm not talking about for religious reasons or anything Mm -hmm. like that, if you're going to do it for health reasons, but you hate beans, that might not be the best diet for you because Mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to meet your protein needs and your health is probably going to suffer along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just talking to um, another, we were doing another interview with this awesome dietitian on low FODMAP. And she said, you know, one of the things that if you're layering on top, if you're low FODMAP and, you know, vegan or, or primarily plant-based, um, you know, we have to look at certain things. I mean, I'm a huge fan of hemp seeds. I, I bring hemp seeds with me or, you know, that's my replacement a lot of times because I don't eat uh, most of the time like chicken or meat or those kinds of things. Um, And so I think it's finding those, as you were saying, those replacements um, rather than thinking about it as, um, you know, just, uh, um, hey, I'm just going to get my protein from these other sources, you know, so making sure you have that piece. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think has been a really big myth um, propagated by, I think, a lot of different uh, of these diet and nutrition plans is that the secret to health is that we need more protein. Um, So, you know, whether plant-based or not, let's just tackle the is more protein better. So the first thing is, amazingly, despite what all of us are hearing from the buzz that's around there is we all, for the most part, get enough protein, right? The problem isn't that we don't get enough of it. That said, um, we don't seem to eat it in the most advantageous manner. Mm. And the reason I say that is protein is a nutrient. I like to call it use it or lose it. You know, if you eat 
um, carbs, your body can actually store those in your liver and to a lesser degree in your muscles. When you eat fat, we all know we can store that everywhere, but you can't store protein anywhere. Mm. So what happens is when you eat protein, your body needs it throughout the day. So the American way is kind of to eat a bagel or a muffin at breakfast. Okay, you're not getting any protein there. Maybe you have a salad for lunch, probably not getting any protein there. And then all of a sudden dinner comes around and we have a huge serving of protein, you know, these giant sized chicken breasts, an enormous piece of steak, but your body can't use all that protein. So some of it is wasted. So to back up, if you were to have the same amount of protein, maybe even that you had at dinner and space that throughout the day, your body would be able to use it much more to your advantage for so many things. So especially, and then there's another benefit of protein too, you know, there's the muscle building benefit, but protein for people who are trying to manage their weight has amazing qualities in that it keeps us full for a really long time. So if you're eating a big piece of chicken at dinner because you're trying to lose weight and it's a lean protein and it's a great choice, that's wonderful. But it's what about the rest of the day? You didn't get any of those filling benefits. And um, protein has another really cool quality in that it takes our bodies, we need more energy to digest it. Mm -hmm. So if you eat an equal amount of carbs versus protein, you're actually not getting as many calories from that protein as you'd get from the carbs. Well, if you do that a few times a day, right, that's a wonderful benefit. I mean, there really aren't, it's not a free food or anything, but we don't get many freebies in the world of eating. So anything that goes along with that can help. So it's it's really a matter of, um, you know, I wouldn't call it strategy, but it, it, it's just planning it out. It's like, if you're going to have protein, how are you going to make it work harder for you? Yeah. So let's go through an example on that part. You mentioned like what we could call what I would call sort of like the busy person, i.e. the every person um, diet where, you know, the morning's coffee and a grab and go or maybe something at a meeting, a bagel. It might be um, quick oats or, you know, just something quick, a piece of fruit. Um, lunchtime, you know, maybe it's a salad that has the chicken on it. Maybe it doesn't. Um, some sort of a snack in the afternoon. Then at dinner, it's all all out craziness through to the, whatever you're eating while the Game of Thrones is is wrapping up. So, right. um, what would you if you were um, sort of strategizing a healthy day of eating? Um, I'm not even going to use the word healthy because now a lot of people are just like, oh, it can't be delicious. So, what would be a <laughs> fun day of eating that would uh, help you meet your your protein needs? Okay, so for a fun day of eating, yeah. For example, let's say that you're not a breakfast person, right? instead of getting a cup of coffee, get a latte, right? That latte probably has eight grams at least of really high quality protein. Mm -hmm. If you are a breakfast person, there are, you know, if you're inclined to cook, eggs are great. Um, There's a little confusion on how many we should be having, but (laughs) I would say an egg is okay. You could also pick up like a protein box on your way to work from someplace like Starbucks. Cereal and milk are great choices or a smoothie, I would say that you make yourself, you know, I'm very wary of smoothies that we buy um, out of the house, because they're just too enormous. And they a lot of times don't have really the ingredients that we need for good nutrition. But if you're making your own, well, you could put in some um, plain Greek yogurt in there, you could add in addition some milk, but if that's just like too much dairy free, you could add almond milk, you could add oat milk, you could add anything else, because you're getting the protein from the yogurt, you can put in a little peanut butter for some more protein and healthy fat. So that's a good way to just drink it down. So those are a few really quick Mm -hmm. breakfast ideas. Um, Lunch is always a challenge for everybody all the time because lunch never really comes into our mind until it's time to eat it. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm starving. What am I gonna have? That's right. So, um, you know, a few things are like you said with a salad. If you're gonna have a salad, I recommend always putting some protein in it. Salad without protein, it's just, I mean, the vegetables are great and everything, but I think you're just gonna be starving an hour later. (laughs) So that protein could be chicken, it could be beans, it could be some grilled fish, it could be actually tuna fish or canned salmon, which it's funny, you know, processed foods get such a bad reputation, so we start to think that everything that comes in a can (laughs) is garbage. Um, But I am a huge, huge fan of canned tuna and salmon because none of us eat enough fish. We need it for heart and brain health. It's so easy. You don't have to cook it. 
So, right, like who knows how to cook fish? I mean, Mm -hmm. it's a lot of work, it smells (laughs) up the house. So those are really easy ways to do it. But if you're not a salad person, there's always, you know, a sandwich or even a taco that's maybe made with some grilled chicken, a burrito bowl, again, with grilled chicken or beans. The only thing that I would steer clear of is eating a lot of red meat for protein. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I guess if you ask 10 different dietitians, you'll get 10 different answers on this. Uh, I worry a lot about people eating too much red meat. I think the jury's still out on saturated fat. We just don't know where that stands. So I see that as kind of like a treat food, but not an everyday or several times a week food. Awesome. And then I'm going to pop in for one second because one of our one of my favorite friends, Bob, um, just popped in. Uh, Bob is uh, I see him on a lot of different Facebook lives, asks great questions, and he's asking about protein powders. So I think this is kind of going back to, you know, and so and I think also, too, with a nod to if you're dairy free. So if you're not having um, yogurt, like you were mentioning, you could put Greek yogurt in your smoothie. But um, for some people, they're not choosing that. And what's interesting is if you choose a coconut yogurt or an almond yogurt, you might not be getting the protein. So that's important. So when it comes to protein powder, um, do you have any favorites or anything that you, um, and this is for more on the plant-based side. Yeah. Right. So here's, I'm going to put on my writer's hat a little bit. Mm -hmm. One thing I've noticed along lines in the past few years is a lot of times I'll see an article and they'll say, you know, this study found that whey protein is the best for this, or pea protein is the best for this. And as I've been researching this, I found that you can find a study that says any of those proteins are the best for anything. Right. The differences are so minuscule, and there really aren't many studies on them. So it's kind of like you're comparing a very small amount of studies. I would say pick whatever protein powder you like, mm. um, whatever works for you. You know, some people can't have soy. It just doesn't agree with them. Some people don't like the texture of other protein powders. Find the one that you find works best for you for whatever reason and and, and don't sweat it. Um, So yeah, if you need more protein and suggestions, the whole food suggestions don't work for you or you're a vegan and you just can't seem to get enough, protein powder works. I think that if you do eat a regular really well-rounded diet, you don't need to add protein powder Mm -hmm. to your food. There's, you're probably, it's easy to get enough protein. As I said, most of us get more than we need. It's just the way we eat it. That's the issue. So you really have to look at where you're coming from and what your needs are. I love that. So Bob, we didn't call out particular brands. Um, I think some of the ones that you are mentioning uh, are are great choices, um, depending and things like plant fusion and Um, some of these ones that are blending different plants I like and to the question that somebody else is asking about um, you know uh, rice and arsenic I mean there there are a lot of issues that can come up on one um, at a time but uh, going back to the start of the conversation with Karen she was really talking about how um, both in her diet is very is varied uh, and also the benefits of following a varied plant-based diet Um, so, uh, we're going to get to your question. So Bob's like throwing the questions in. We wanted to talk about, um, beyond burgers. Um, are they healthy or are they less healthy? Um, you know, are they, are they pulling the wool over our eyes as they are the darlings of the stock exchange market right now? And then Bob's second question is just how, how many grams of protein are good for me? So that's great. Bob is, is leading our, our, uh, interview here. Um, so let's start off just because it's very timely. Um, Karen, I have my own beliefs on, um, you know, and I really love the taste of my Beyond Burger um, or sausage. Um, I'm not a personally a fan of the impossible stuff, but uh, what do you think about the the stock exchange's newest uh, darling, as I was mentioning? So I have not had the Beyond Burger or the Impossible Burger, and I'm not as familiar with the Beyond Burger mm. as the Impossible Burger. Um, so maybe you could just give me a quick Sure. Yeah. So the compares to the Impossible Burger. Yeah. So the difference. So the Impossible Burger is the one that has the heme that's made from the soy to sort of make it look bloody. Um, I like to put beets in anything if I need it to look bloody. So I just go that route instead. But um, with the Beyond Burger, um, what they really did was look at the amount of protein that you would get from a meat burger. Um, So it's about twenty three grams, I think, is the is the base burger, and it's um, pea protein and then coconut oil, and the, the ingredients are. That's pretty much it. There might be one or two other ingredients in there, um, but it's uh, pretty straightforward. A 
um, like a protein powder concoction, you know, that's made into a <laughs> burger. Um, I think it tastes fantastic. I will say I go to my bear burger and, um, you know, I, if I'm not having a turkey burger, I, I love, you know, I'm, I'm good with it. Um, but I'm also not somebody who throws back a lot of pea protein, you know, consistently. So um, I think that would be uh, my take on it. Yeah. I mean, I would say that if it tastes good for you and you definitely want to get it away from meat, the Beyond Burger, it, it sounds fine. The Impossible Burger, um, I kind of that, lump that in with the category of it reminds me of, you know, when we decided that butter wasn't good for us and we all started eating margarine. Mm -hmm. I just kind of wonder when you put that many things together to try to make something that's replicating a really natural food, what that really does to our bodies. So I'm not saying never eat it, but it's just like if I was going to have a veggie burger, I'd want to have something that was actually made with veggies. Mm -hmm. um, I That's just me. I know there are people who really do struggle with trying to cut down their intake of meat. I'm not saying never eat it, but I do just kind of wonder um, about the long-term health benefits of it and wouldn't we just be better off having things made of real whole ingredients? Yeah, I'm, I'm so there with you. And, you know, down the street for me is the White Castle headquarters and White Castle has, you know, the new Impossible Burger. And it's like, hey, I just don't think White Cat like I think a White Castle is if it's a ball game that you're going to like once a month and you decide to get some sliders. But, um, you know, and so I, I like the plant based side of it, but I'm, I'm with you. I, I don't think on a, on a regular basis. So Trina also brought up the egg comment um, and she was saying, I love eggs. Um, sometimes I eat four a day. Is that too many for me per day? Um, Trina, just a reminder, we're not going to give any personal information. Likewise with Bob, we're not going to tell you exactly how many grams to get in, but let's do it. Let's have the egg conversation, Karen. <laughs> Ooh, the egg conversation is tough because this is one, even I think, you know, nutritionists are confused. And, and I think it really boils down to different diets for different people. Everybody's body works differently. So, if you can eat four eggs a day and your cholesterol is fine, you probably don't need to worry about it as much as, for example, if I ate four eggs a day, I don't even want to think what would happen to my cholesterol. <laughs> right. um, I think eggs are a great healthy food. I eat them all the time. I still do question whether they might not raise your cholesterol if you're eating lots of them. So I would say, you know, kind of back into it and see, I would definitely, I think, all adults should get their cholesterol tested every year. Um, if you're eating a lot of eggs and your cholesterol is high, then I would back off a little bit. If you're eating a lot of eggs and your cholesterol is fine, I don't think you need to sweat it. So yeah. it really depends. Four sounds like it might be on the high side. Um, yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. So. And Trina, you know, one of the things that I that I would step in on, on this part, too, is just say, like, not all eggs are the same. And this isn't just even a question of organic or free range, um, but a lot of chickens are not healthy. And then their eggs, as a result, just not the same as some others. And so I think the quality of, of the egg and then also what are you having with the egg? Right. Yes. <laughs> so I think we um, but, you know, so for some people, they they don't have cheese. They're not having bacon. They're not, you know, so. Um, you know, what is your, uh, on that part, you know, can that be healthy? But yeah, I think, I think I, I totally um, am with Karen on that piece. So Bob led us as he leads us down the path on, on this interview. Um, he wants to know how many grams should he get in? And I think this is a really interesting question because um, again, like the uh, recommendations that I see online when I'm on social media or just what I see people meal prepping and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, their poor kidney and liver is, is getting 40 <laughs> grams at one time with that meal, right? So how do we figure out how many grams roughly um, we need uh, in from, from your estimation on that part? So there, there's a little bit of, uh, of debate on this. Um, you know, for years, we've been told that a little less than a gram for every kilogram we weigh is the right amount. Um, many people are starting to question this, but what I like to do is I just like to round up. So if the RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram, I say a gram per kilogram. I don't think you can go wrong one way or the other with that. Um, in terms of, I know kilogram sounds like a weird science -y thing. I was just going to say, it's always, I, I've always thought it is hysterical that in the U.S. where we use kilograms for nothing weight right. wise, <laughs> we don't have just a recommendation in pounds, but carry on. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I would say to simplify that, forget about kilograms, about half a gram for every pound you weigh, right? Because otherwise we're talking about fractions. It really doesn't mm -hmm. make a difference. A whole lot more than that, your body just can't really do much with it. 
if you're a bodybuilder, I guess you could have a little more, but much more than that, your body is just gonna break it down and try really hard to get rid of it. Because as I said, you can only use a certain amount at a certain time. Mm -hmm. So I really like that quick and easy formula. Yeah. Half a gram for every pound. So if you're, if you're a 200 pound person, about a hundred grams. And then what Karen was saying before, which like, I want to like echo to the 9,000, whatever volume I could amplify it to is, um, to split it up throughout the day, just like you're drinking water, just like your fiber, anything else, like your body is going to do better if you pit stop for protein than if you backload the truck up. Um, so yeah, so Bob, you might need more. And one of the things that you would want to think about, depending on, you know, if you're, uh, getting close to that 75 grams, but think about it this way. If you split it up into five or six times in the day, uh, then you could look at how much your, um, you know, you can break it up into numbers that feel a lot better than when you look at that 75 grams. So I can definitely appreciate that. Um, so one of the questions that we got um, from someone, and this is where the media, so I, I, I want to ask a media related questions, but she said to the question she sent in um, to, to ask you is she read that you need digestive enzymes to break down, you need to take digestive enzymes to break down protein in your body. So um, first of all, how does an article like that get written? Like, I want to know on that part. And second of all, or said differently, how can you read an article like that as the layperson and say, no, like, that's not, you know, what, what we need to either take away or that's not a good article. Um, but also then we can actually dive into what she's really asking. But let's start off with the media side of the question. So media wise, I mean, the first thing I would say is to kind of back into it. I'd be curious to know, and I'm not suggesting that we name names here, but just from the reader's perspective, where did that article mm -hmm. come from? Was that article in somebody's blog? Was that on a website, maybe from a company? Or was it even on a website where a company might have paid a publication to take their information and use it? Or it might have just been on a random website for any kind of publication. But um, so there's a really wide spectrum of where things are written. And just like there's a wide spectrum of where things are written, there's a wide spectrum of backgrounds of writers. Some writers have, some writers write about health, they write about finance, they write about travel, they write about beauty. They're great writers, but they are not, in doing so, they're not trained in nutrition. They don't have, you know, Ashley and I were talking before we started about our extensive science <laughs> backgrounds. Um, to become a dietitian, you need to take a lot of science and you need to take a lot of nutrition courses. And as they're writing this, do they have the background to really understand everything they're writing? If a dietitian wrote that article, they would not be telling you that you need digestive enzymes to process any kind of protein because that's what your body does for mm -hmm. you. You're equipped with those enzymes. Um, if we didn't, I mean, how would our ancestors have ever eaten these foods, right? So, you know, digestive en enzymes that are sold are a very new product on the market, relatively speaking. People have been eating protein since the beginning of time. We've obviously all been using it very well. In fact, I would say that generations prior to ours were healthier than we are right now. Mm -hmm. We're having all kinds of chronic disease issues. So, um, so you really have to look at who's writing it. Many magazines, you know, magazines that have big names that you've probably heard of before, usually have, in addition to having health experts write, they also have fact checking, which is extensive. So this is, um, you know, it can be the bane of a writer's existence. When you write an article for these magazines, you have to substantiate every single fact in that article. And it can't be like, hey, this is from WebMD. And I love WebMD, by mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. I actually have to go to what's called the primary source, the original study where this information came from. And in many cases, that study has to be very recent too. Mm -hmm. So it can't be like the study was done in 1968. Um, it's more like the study had to be done within the past five years. So really reputable magazines have really, really rigorous fact checking where you can't just throw anything in there. And even if an expert says something, like even if they you know, interviewed Ashley or I, if something sounded amiss, they would still want one of those primary sources to back it up. So there's really a, a very solid foundation. But the with the internet now, there's, I mean, anybody can 
write about nutrition and anybody can call themselves a nutritionist. You know, I joke with my kids all the time. It's like, well, you could say you're a nutritionist <laughs> and they could. Right. Um, so it, it really, it, it's a matter of finding sources that you really trust. Where are you getting that information from? What are you reading? Um, and I don't think you need to even do the extra legwork to find out, is it being sponsored by another company or not? It's just a matter of, is it a, a reputable name, a reputable name in journalism? I think if it's a reputable name in journalism, you can be comfortable with it. I know I have just been blown away with the editors that I've worked with over the years. Um, in most cases, they are not dietitians, they are not health professionals, but they really know their stuff. So, editors um, who work in health for these major publications, they know how to suss out the nonsense mm -hmm. um, right away. Yeah. Um, other other publications, they may just take what a writer hands them and nobody ever even looks at it. So there's a really broad spectrum of quality out there. Yeah, I think it's so important on that one because um, also like as more and more, and I know this personally now running an online company, um, I, I've had to like take courses and start to understand how SEO works, you know, so that I can, my stuff can get seen. But um, you have people who are really good at SEO. And so their articles are like going way higher even than the WebMD article or the article that Karen researched, you know, for days on end and interviewed experts. Um, and remember, when we're talking about nutrition experts um, in particular, um, or healthcare practitioners that are experts, I really judge that or define that as somebody who can review the science, but also has an expertise in applying it to the individual. So um, for example, the digestive enzyme one is a great one. I am a practitioner for 20 years. Um, for 15 of those years, I've prescribed digestive enzymes. Not to everyone, you know, there are a few patients that, you know, sometimes I have people who are lactose intolerant and they need an enzyme or it could be helpful there, not because they should have lactose all the time, but um, maybe if they are have it, this is going to be a way that um, they'll feel better in that short time period. And with protein, one of the things as Karen and I were talking about um, earlier on uh, is that as you make changes in your diet, if you move to more of a plant-based diet, um, and you're not doing so well with beans or some of these things, there can be uses for enzymes where they're helpful as a tool for the body, but your body makes digestive enzymes. So what you're really saying is that if something isn't working, it's probably a sign that um, the production of the enzymes is not happening optimally. That usually is just a really good um, wake up call to, to tune up digestion. So we would have had this conversation, but our SEO might not have uh, matched the, you know, whoever um, Yo Digest or whatever company, you know, is out there with that part. So I think you have to be really careful, unfortunately, when you're Googling or searching for what comes to, to the top, uh, you know, on that part. Um, Karen, I thought um, just for in, in wrapping up, you mentioned kids. I know you've got a college age. Shout out again yes. to Duke. So that part is great. Um, so one of the um, uh, someone who wrote in ahead of time was asking me, um, they're really struggling with their child. Um, and I, I didn't get an age of the child. So let's just arbitrarily say 10 year old. I'm, I don't know what the age of the child is. Um, because all they love are carbs. They're just not getting in protein. Um, and so we had talked about dairy in the beginning. Um, what about a child here where we're just really struggling um, to meet their protein needs? Uh, you know, is there, uh, do you have any um, fun tricks that you've employed or, or that uh, have come up through your research? Right. So I haven't employed fun tricks for a long time because my kids are grown. Uh, <laughs> That's right. But I would say that the first thing to realize is that, um, you know, kids don't need as much protein as adults do. I can't throw out an amount because there's a really um, complicated scale of how much protein a child needs based on their age. But a 10 year old needs considerably less protein than an adult. Now, you might hear that kids need more like the phrase kids need more protein, but that needs to be followed by per pound of body weight. So mm. it's not that, cause that's something that gets very confusing. So they don't need more protein. They just need more for every pound they weigh. Mm. A 10 year old doesn't weigh very much. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I wouldn't get too, too stressed about it if the child is growing properly, right? If mm -hmm. the kid is on their growth curve, it's probably not much of an issue. Mm. If the child is falling off their growth curve, there are a few things you can do. Um, and that is if they really do love carbs all the time is to add some protein containing foods to the carbs. So mm -hmm. for example, if the child loves pasta, could you have pasta with a regular meat sauce or a turkey meat sauce or something like that? Um, 
if the child will eat, you know, tacos, could you do like a bean taco? Um, could you do quesadillas that have some mm. cheese in it? So I would say to try and sneak in little bits throughout the day, smoothies are really great ways to get protein in mm -hmm. there. And nut butters are really great ways to get pro protein in there. They're not, you know, huge sources, but it, again, it's just sneaking it in throughout the day as it goes along. Um, I don't know if you have any tricks that I haven't mentioned. It's no, I'm right there with you. I, I think the concern, you know, of course, like if you have concerns, this is, this to me is like an optimal time to connect with a dietitian and, uh, you know, your doctor and dietitian to work on some specific planning. What I would say is sometimes it actually belies an issue. So, um, you know, do find, do talk to your child. You know, I, I will, would suggest, especially with a 10 year old doing our digestive evaluation or having a conversation because it may be that they're avoiding things based on how they feel. Um, or it could be they're deciding to avoid things. There are a lot of kids that um, start to have the animal conversation and they just are, you know, vegan uh, or vegetarian because they're sad about their, um, the, you know, about animals uh, and, and animal product consumption. And so I think that's a great opportunity to talk about the life cycle of animals and um, and just how different animals are treated and, you know, these kinds of things. So I think you can learn a lot before you turn to what solution might be best um, because I, I think by having those conversations you'll come up with a better solution. Um, but I like your recommendations. I also do teach people that seeds, um, for those that are avoiding nuts. So I mentioned hemp seeds before, yes. sesame seeds. Um, and then the variety of carbohydrates can also help you get in some more of those amino acids. So um, just making sure, you know, trying to the best of your ability to make sure that your, cl your uh, client, listen to me, that your child is not um, uh, mono eating, uh, that, that is probably also going to be really helpful, but, um, oh, wow. We could keep going on. I told Karen we would do a half hour, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you guys, uh, grab, follow her on social media because you can get well-researched, well-authored articles, um, that, uh, she's sharing there. And then also over on her website, um, you can get more information and also see, uh, articles that she has written. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. Really oh, enjoyed thank it. Thank you, Ashley. It was great. Awesome. So good to see you. You too.